picture? Man, I hope so. Of course, if you don't recognize the picture on the screen right now, it means that either you're, you're probably fairly new here or you've been asleep for the past three or four years. This is, um, yeah, it could be either one, right? Um, this is kind of how we see our world. And you're looking at that maybe and you're thinking, okay, what do you mean this is how you see your world? Well, you can, you can put your pens and paper down a little bit because I'm not worried about the blanks in your bulletin right now. I'm worried about the blanks on the screen. This little image was taken from a story where Jesus called Peter to a deeper relationship. And remember, in our picture, in our worldview, everybody starts in the same place. They start in our community. community. There we go. And the community is where, is where we see everybody starting. Now, when we say the community, that means we're talking about the people that are just outside of the church, the people that sit on the shores of our life, that don't really attend anywhere. They're just part of the community. They're not really looking for God. And so it is our job as the church, just like Jesus approached Jesus, me approached Peter and said, hey, can I use your boat? Thus Peter having to push the boat out from the shore a little bit, Peter instantly moved from the community to the crowd. To the crowd. So, so now Peter is now sitting there and he's beginning to listen to what's being taught and he's gone from just sitting there doing his job, he's actually got some interest into listening to what Jesus has to say. Of course, Jesus wasn't done with him. He finished his little message to the crowd, and he looked at Peter, and he said, let's go out fishing. Dean's favorite words, let's go fishing. So, so they go out, and they go fishing, and, and Peter puts down the nets, and they begin to pull it in, and he realizes who Jesus is, and he goes from just being part of a crowd, he makes a genuine connection. It's always the one we have the trouble with, right? He became connected to Jesus. He realized that Jesus is more than just this prophet, just more than this great teacher. He realized that he's the Messiah. He's something different. And so he begins to, to think about, oh my gosh, I'm not worthy to be sitting here in front of you. And so, so I, I, Jesus, I just got to get away from you. And Jesus said, hey, just calm down. We have a plan. Don't worry about this. Let's get to the shore. And they pull the fish up on. And then Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Peter, I'm not done with you yet. Why don't you pull the boat up on the shore and follow me? And the second Peter pulls that boat up, he goes from being just part of the connected to being part of the committed. committed. See, this is how the world works. This is how people come to a relationship with Christ. This is how we are supposed to be doing this. We're not out there trying to, to do everything. We're just trying to make that first simple step to make people, ask people to come out of the community and be part of the crowd. Simple questions like, Want to go hang out with me? Want to come to church with me? Want to do the, just something simple? But, you know, wouldn't it be great if everybody you walk down the street from and said, want to come to church? And they said, sure. And they showed up the next Sunday. Wouldn't it be great if it worked that way? Wouldn't that be awesome if, you, if your batting average was 100% and every person you asked actually showed up? It'd be kind of encouraging to keep asking people, right? But let's be realistic. We look at this view and it's all blue and there's really nothing between the different sections. It flows one from the other, but it doesn't work that way, does it? See, around each of these areas, moving people from the community to the crowd, from the crowd to the connected, from the connected to the committed, there are barriers. There are these reasons and excuses and all this other stuff that people throw up to say why they can't make that next step. Why it is that they are where they are, and they're not going to move any further, and they're just happy and content, and they just throw up barriers. And those barriers are frustrating. Sometimes you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall just trying to get somebody to come to the boat, let alone move into a genuine relationship with Christ. But you know, barriers are kind of there. You can't deny it. People are going to have reasons. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks, all wrapped up in a fun little baseball theme, we are going to discuss the four barriers that we usually put up when it comes to moving not only other people, but ourselves from one point of life to the next. And the good news is, is there are four of them that we're going to discuss. And just by chance, there are four bases in the baseball game. Then it work out great that way. Someone, somebody planned it that way. So, so we've got four bases that we're going to cover. We're going we're gonna to run around these bases over the next four weeks. And no, I'm not actually running, just so you know that. If you ever see me running, you should be scared because you know what? That means something big is chasing me. So 
So that's about the only time I run. So, so but we're going we're gonna to take a spiritual run around these bases, and we're going to examine the things that we put up in place, the things, the way that we just tell God, I'm not ready to move from one area to the next. And I want to start with some thought-provoking questions. This idea of the hard makes it great, and I want to know, have you ever quit something? Yep. You ever just called it quits, just gave up on something? Now, when I say, have you ever quit something, I know there, there are, there's some good quitting. There are, there are bad habits that you have in your life, and at some point, you decide, I'm going to stop, and you can fill in the blank. I'm going to stop attending buffets because I eat too much when I go to them, or I'm, I'm going to stop biting my fingernails, or I'm going to stop. You can fill in the blank there, but I'm going to stop that, and, and so you quit, and you have to work really hard. That's, that's a good kind of quitting. You know, there's another good kind of quitting, and that is um, when it's a need. We've just outgrown it. When I was, um, I guess I was probably about Caleb's age. I was in middle school. The Dukes of Hazard was a big thing on television. And I had this really, really cool blue shirt that had a picture of the General Lee on the front of it, and it had the glitter on the, on the, on the, on the, the flag, and so it was nice and shiny, and it had the, the Duke boys and Daisy Duke in the middle of it. And, and it was a really cool shirt for a middle schooler in the 19-whatever. Um, it was a really cool shirt for that time, but just so you know, I don't have that shirt anymore. And if I had it, it wouldn't fit, Okay. <laughs> Because I outgrew the shirt, so I had to quit wearing the shirt. So, so I'm not talking about quitting a bad habit. I'm not talking about, about quitting something because you just flat out grew it. I want to know, have you ever really just quit? Just quit. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you had a relationship in your life, and you just decided that relationship needs to go, so you quit. Maybe it was a job. Maybe you had a job and it just got too overwhelming, so you just quit. Maybe it was younger. When you were younger, you quit some sport team. Hey, maybe it's been church. Maybe you're a person that's gone in and out of church, and you know what? Things have gotten hard in the past, and so you know what? You've just decided, I'm, I'm going to take a break. I'm just going to quit. Here's a question. Have you ever regretted quitting? You ever look back on those days when you gave something up, you quit something, and, and, and you just regret it? I can't swim. I don't know if many of you guys know that. Okay, I can swim if you count swimming like a rock. Swimming. Um, and just so you know, I, I've taken swimming lessons before. I mean, I went to church camp my entire life, and my, my entire teenage years, and, and, and they tried to teach me to swim, but I just never quite got it. So eventually, you know what? I stopped signing up for swim classes. I decided to go do other things when I went to camp. I just wasn't going to try. I just quit on it. And now today I have two kids that swim like fish. They're great swimmers. And they're out there in the pool and they're, they're having fun. And you know what? I can't go participate in that because I really can't go past the five-foot mark because it'll be over my head. And I can't swim. So, so when I'm at the pool or I'm at the lake and I see other people do I, I regret the fact that I didn't stick with it and learn how to swim. Have you ever had those kind of regrets in your life far beyond swimming? Where there's just something in your life that you quit, and later on in life, you begin to think back and you're like, why did I quit? What on earth made me think quitting was a good idea? Where did I ever come up with the thought that, that quitting would do something good for me? And, and really, we, we have our reasons. There are reasons we quit. Not enough time is what we tell ourselves, right? I don't have time for that. I'm too busy. Not really my thing. That's what I used to say about the swimming thing. It's not really my, I don't really care that much about swimming. It's not my kind of thing. I don't get along with one person or some people. So you know what? I just think I'll quit. Maybe you just lost interest. Maybe you were really gung-ho about it, but when you realized how much work it actually was, you decided, not for me. You know why we quit? It's just too hard. That's really the only reason you quit anything, is it just gets too hard. And what I mean by it just gets too hard, it means that the benefit that you perceive you're going to get out of it 
outweighs the effort that you're going to put into it. That's what too hard means. It means that the resources you put into something are far outweighed by what benefit you're... So, so you quit. You do. And this is where your notes pick up because we're going to talk about commitment. We're going to talk about moving between those rings. And here's what you need to know. Commitment is supposed to be hard. What did Tom Hanks say in the video clip? If it was easy... Everybody would do it. If I could walk out to the pool and the first time I jumped in, I could swim the length of the pool and backpack and do the the doggy stroke and all. If I could have done that, you know what? I'd still be swimming today. But when it took the coordination and the time and the energy and I had other things that I wanted to do, it just didn't seem that too important. No commitment. If you're going to make any kind of commitment in your life, it's going to require some time. To my knowledge, there isn't a single solitary person that plays a sport. I don't care whether it's baseball, football, basketball, that doesn't make a time commitment to go out and do the little things, to pay attention to it. Commitment takes time, even commitment to God. Commitment takes resources. Don't believe it? Go talk to a parent that has their child involved in Little League Baseball these days. Man, on top of all of the the time it takes to get the kids to the practice, and on top of the time it takes to to get the kids kids here and get them to travel ball and to get them this, you have to go out and buy the equipment and all these little tournaments they they, they go to, you got to pay for, and then you've got the gas to take yourself to there, and by the way, then you got to figure out the time. It takes some of your resources if you're going to be committed to anything in your life. Works that way in marriage, right? If you're going to have a committed marriage... It's going to cost you some resources. Commitment's going to require some sacrifice. You can't be committed to something and sleep in every single morning. It doesn't work. If you don't believe that, then just go by the ball fields on a Saturday morning. And you will see the ball field somewhere around 8 o'clock in the morning loaded up with kids playing soccer or football or baseball. Pick your sport. They'll be out there doing something. And just so you know, to get a kid there at that time, you had to drag them out of the bed at 7 o'clock in the morning if you're lucky, if you live really close to the ball field. Because you had to get them breakfast and you had to get them dressed and you had to yell at them for at least 20 minutes to hurry up. And it just works that way. It takes some sacrifice if you're going to actually be committed to something. That's the way it works. It's going to be some conflict. It's not going to always be rosy. You're going to have disagreements with your coaches. You're going to have disagreements with your, with your, with your fellow players. You're going to have disagreements with people on the other team. There's going to be conflict. Going to be some physical pain involved. You're going to go out and you're going to do a practice, and the next morning you're going to you're going to get up and you're going to think that was a dumb idea. I remember when I was playing little league ball, I got the bright idea one day I was going to wear a tank shirt out to to play to practice, and it was an all day practice. I'm not kidding you. A few days later, I had blisters the side of head eggs up on my shoulders. Because I just burned and I blistered so bad. I had a small case of sun poisoning. It was some physical pain to go out and do that practice that day. There's going to be some heartache. If you commit, there's going to be some moments when you put all of your energy into it and you lay yourself out there. And in one silly little word, somebody's going to rip your heart straight out. And they probably aren't even going to mean to. They just kind of did it. They weren't thinking through with it. And it, it, it just hurts. And I guess I look at all of those things that commitment costs, and I wonder, why bother? Why would I commit to anything? Why would I bother to go out and play a sport? Why would I go out and try to learn an instrument like we saw this morning? Why, why would I do it? Why on earth would I ever make a commitment to God if that's what it's going to cost me? Well, there's some things that you get from commitment. And that's where I want to pick up this morning. I want to look at some few, a few scriptures that begin to tell us, why should I commit my life specifically to Christ? Why do I want to work my way through all of those red barriers to go from being part of the community to being part of the crowd and part of the crowd to being part of the connected and part of the connected to being part of the commitment? Why do I want to go through all of that effort? Well, let me give you some reasons. Because of the example. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. I pointed this out at communion time, that, that Jesus willingly made his sacrifice. Jesus willingly made that commitment. Nobody sprung it on him at the end to say, oh, by the way, you went through all this. Did I happen to tell you the end of the story? Oh, no. And he made that commitment not for people that were loving, not for people that were seeking, but for people that were sinning. People that were doing the very things that he had asked not to do. And it's this example that Jesus shows us. I choose you just because you've chosen me. That example should encourage us to commit. And if the example of Jesus by himself isn't enough for you, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. This is what it says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, that's where it starts, the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God right hand of the throne of God. So here's Jesus, and not only did he show us the example of giving his life, he showed us the example of endurance, and he showed us the example that, you know what, I'm going to go and live with God. You see, that example that Jesus gives us allows us to understand we commit because we see what Christ did for us. You ever had that person in your past, I don't care whether it's a teacher or whether it's somebody on a sport team, you watch them and maybe they weren't the best player and maybe they weren't the best teacher, but by golly, every time they got out there, they gave it 100% everything that they got. And you know what? It inspired you, didn't it? It made you decide because they're willing to give everything and look at what they can do. If I give my everything, maybe I can do the same. We should be willing to commit because of the example that was given us. How about this one? We're better at this one. We commit because there's a reward. This is what Philippians chapter 3, verse 14 says. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There's a reward out there. You want to get a kid inspired to do something? Set a trophy in front of them. Ooh, trophy. My, my, my youngest son went out to play, play um, found the pitch baseball, not coach pitch. It was the little machine, machine pitch baseball a few years ago. And just so you know, Benji's not coordinated enough to play baseball. He tried. He gave his little heart trying to do this. But it's just, it really is not his thing. But I want to tell you something. He gave it his all. And he wasn't really sure he wanted to stay on the team until they got near the end of the season. And he realized they were tied for first place. And... Then he found out that the last game, win or lose, both the first and second place team got a trophy. Just so you know, we were early for that game. I didn't have any trouble getting Benji ready for that baseball game because you know why? Because when he was done, there's a trophy for you here. Thank you for all of you. And it inspired him to want to commit to be there. Doesn't it kind of work that way for us? Philippians tells us that there's a prize out there for us that we are going to get to spend eternity with God if we commit, if we are willing to press toward the mark, a runner's term, if we're willing to run the race to the finish. We were all in awe this week because the Triple Crown winner, they got all three races and says, so they got the Triple Crown. But you realize to get the Triple Crown, the horse couldn't finish just one race in first. Couldn't finish just two races in first. The horse had to commit to three races. You have to be willing to commit to finish the race that you start. But God says if you do that, there's a reward for you. There's something in in it for you. There's another reason this kind of moves away from just the baseball thing. It moves into into the godly thing. Why should we commit? Well, because really we want to grow. We do. We, we want to we wanna grow. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials and many kinds, because you know that you, your testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's what happens. We want to we wanna grow. I don't want to be the same tomorrow that I am today. I don't want my, my spiritual life to be just what it is. 
I want to grow. Well, you realize if I want to grow, then I'm going to have to go through that barrier. If I want to grow, I hate to tell you this, you can't just sit in the crowd. If you want to grow, you can't just stay just like you are and expect yourself to be anything more than what you are. You're going to have to move to the next phase. And if you really want to grow, you can't just establish the fact that I know who Jesus is. You can't just make that connection. You're eventually going to have to move to the middle because you want to grow. This is what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Not only, so, but we, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Want to grow? Look at what you have to go through. Look at your barriers. <laughs> you have to have some suffering. You have to work your way through the suffering so that you can learn some perseverance, and perseverance to learn character, that word that we all seem to strive for. And it's only when you reach that point that you get to understand what the word hope is. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't get to come down an aisle and say a prayer and get dunked in the tank and say, hey, look, I'm committed. That's not commitment. That's a bath. It doesn't work that way. Committed means that you're in for the long haul because you want to grow. Not only do we want to grow, we want to live. This is what John chapter 12, verse 25 says. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for, it, for, for eternal life. There's the idea here that, that I have to commit because I want more than just this life. It's someday when they're placing my body in a six-foot-deep hole or wherever they put it, that's not the end of my life. I want to live beyond what you see here in this little water bag that I walk around in that we call a body. But if I want that, there's that word. I have to commit. I have to be willing. Turn with me in your scribbles to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to talk about this idea of commitment. I've explained to you why you want to do it. Now I want to kind of Put some meat on the bones here. This is what it says. Paul is writing to the church to help them understand commitment. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distresses and beatings, imprisonments and riots and hard work, sleepless nights and hunger and purity, understanding, patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love and truthful speech and in power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and left through the glory through glory and dishonor bad report and good report genuine yet regarded as impostors known yet regarded as unknown dying yet we live on beaten yet not killed sorrowful yet always rejoicing poor yet making many rich having nothing yet possessing everything Paul is admonishing the Corinthian church to get real. Get over it. Make a commitment. Move on. And in that, he, he outlines to them, this is the reason that we're going to do this. There are some goals for a church in making the commitment. And, and don't miss this. Because when we commit, we're going to remove the stumbling blocks for others. We're going to become... The encouragers. We're going to become the testimony. We're going to remove those stumbling blocks so that other people can find their way to a relationship with Christ. We're going to break down the barriers for others. Unfortunately, I think many times, I think somehow we've got it backwards. We think we've arrived and we're supposed to be throwing some stumbling blocks in people's way. Make sure they earn it. Make sure that they, they've done their, their due diligence. But that's not what Paul says. Hey, church... Wake up to this commitment idea. You're supposed to be removing the stumbling blocks. You're supposed to be making sure that your ministry isn't discredited. Discredited in the fact that, that people shouldn't have bad things to say about what you're doing. And I'm not talking about bad things and we don't like the way this is done. That They can't really find a claim against you. See, that's our goal in this commitment. Because it's in that moment that we begin to become a testimony. 
And as Paul states, I want you to understand there's going to be some difficult situations. I just want you to look at the resume that he lays out there. This is what Paul says. He says, through glory and dishonor. So there's going to be some days when you feel like you're being glorified. And there's going to be some days where you just feel like people are dishonoring you. There's going to be some bad reports and good reports. Don't expect to have your name on the wall. Don't expect to be in the Hall of Fame. Because you know what? You're going to be regarded as unknown. Dying yet we live on. Have you ever thought about that? That this might actually cost you your life. I read a quote this week. Um, Commitment, the difference between involvement in the church and commitment in the church is called ham and eggs. Ham and eggs, the chicken is, is, is involved, the pig's committed. You understand? <laughs> ham and eggs, the chicken lays an egg. What does the pig have to do to make ham? It might cost you something. If you're really going to be committed, it's going to cost you more than just an egg. It might mean that you're the ham, and it might cost you your life. Beaten yet not killed. Your life is going to get beaten up if you're going to live a committed life. Anybody ready to sign up for commitment? <sighs> Sounds kind of hard, doesn't it? There's some methods we're going to have to endure. And again, the resume looks kind of bleak. We're going to have to endure troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonment, and riots. It's going to be hard work. Going to be some sleepless nights. You ever had one of those sleepless nights where something is just weighing on your heart? There might even be some hunger involved in this. That's what Paul's talking about. That kind of commitment level. When Jesus says, Peter, pull your boat up on the shore and follow me, that's what Peter signed up for. If we're going to get through this, he gives us a list of job requirements. Understanding. Patience, kindness, love. Do those sound familiar? I hope so. We just finished preaching about them. If not, the CDs are in the back. We're going to have to have some truthful speech. Be honest. And then the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and in our left. We'll talk about those in about a month or so. We're going to have to add some things to our life. I can't just go out tomorrow and pick up a bat on a baseball field and say, okay, throw me the 95-mile-an-hour fastball. I'm ready because it's going to go right past me so fast. I'm like, go ahead, throw it. Catcher's got it. It doesn't work that way. You have to go out and you have to add some things to your life if you're going to be committed. And now you're probably thinking, that sounds kind of hard. Yep. Guess what? The heart is what makes it great. The fact that everybody's not willing to follow this path is exactly what makes this path worth following. Paul tells us there's going to be sorrow on this path, yet we'll always be rejoicing. Paul tells us we're going to be poor on this path, yet we'll be making many rich. Paul tells us we might have nothing on this path, yet we might be possessing everything. But you see, it's the hard that makes it great. Jesus tells a story about those two paths, the narrow one and the wide one. The wide one is the easy path. Easy to get on, easy to follow, easy to stay on. The narrow path, not a lot of people are going to find it. Not a lot of people are willing to walk it. And not a lot of people are willing to follow it all the way to the end. So I guess here's what I want to know. Here we are at first base. Are you committed to greatness? Now, if I asked that question and we were asking it on the baseball field, you'd be like, yeah! If I was asking it on the football field, you'd be like, yeah, we're committed to greatness. Because we know what that means. That means big contracts and lots of money. And, you know, that's what greatness is. But that's not what I'm asking you. I'm not giving it from, from a godly standpoint. Are you willing to commit to greatness. That means you're accepting the resume that Paul lays out for your life. That means it's going to be hard. There are going to be days that you get up and you're going to roll over and you'll be like, you know what, I'm just really not in the mood to be a Christian today. I'm not. 
You know, there are going to be mornings you're going to get up and you're like, you know, I can hit that snooze button a little bit more. That's okay if I miss one Sunday, right? That's okay. There are going to be, there are going to be mornings where we make choices that we don't want to do this, but the heart makes it great means that we do it because we made a commitment to it. It works that way in everything. Church is not the only thing that works that way. It works that way in our marriages. If you're married, face it, okay, you get up some mornings and you don't feel like being married anymore. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> you have those mornings. Everybody does. Parents, you wake up some mornings. You're like, did we really have kids? Are you sure they didn't just follow us home one day? You know, are you really? But, but you've made a commitment, and so you stick with it. God works the same way. It means on the good days and the bad days, when it gets hard, that's when greatness comes out. When it gets difficult, that's when you should be excelling. But so often, more than not, we get to the first base and it gets a little hard. And you know what we do? We, we take off our helmet and we throw it down and we take our glove and we put it down and we take the bat and we throw it in the ball. And we're like, you know what? I don't think this is for me. We don't ever make it past first base. We don't ever make it past just being willing to make the commitment even in the hard times. So let me encourage you today, get in the game. Because you can imagine if this is first base, what do you think the other three are going to look like? This is the barrier number one. You have to decide, I'm going to make the commitment, no matter how hard it gets. No matter what God asks of me, I'm going to make the commitment to go all the way from just being part of a community to actually pulling the boat up on shore and making that commitment. During our time of decision, ponder that thought. What is it you would have to lighten your load of to make the move to the next step? And I don't know where you are on the ring. We'll talk about that later, where you are. But to go from where you are just to get to the next level, what barrier are you going to have to break through? What are you going to have to lay aside? Maybe you're here today and you know what? You're still just part of the community. You've never even made it to the, the crowd status where you're part of the crowd on a regular basis. You're, you're just kind of there and you just kind of show up. Let me encourage you. Maybe it's time that you get serious about your relationship with Christ. Maybe for you, that first step is coming down and understanding what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you need to follow Christ in baptism. See, these are the decisions that we have to make if we are going to live for greatness, not only in this life, but the next. Would you please stand? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing.